I want you to say hi to our favorite, to the superstar Bill Stuff, to the musical star, to the, uh, I, I don't know, but Dylan, you do everything and you do it great. You are also the host of this year's Bill Stuff. I'm, uh, this is true. I'm hosting a track. I did music at the party. The only thing I'm not doing is coming to Lithuania because I managed to get COVID the day before I was supposed to travel. So, uh, but here I am. We can do everything virtually now. We have the technology. And we have the vaccines. I mean, you can sing in, in, the, in the after party. You can, uh, host a spe you can host an event. You can have a session and all that while having COVID. Okay. Uh, okay, so you're going to talk about something <laughs> with a very interesting name, plain text. Plain you're text. anything but plain. <laughs> So that's a <laughs> funny so name. That's, that, that's, that's, the, that's the point. There's more to plain text than you think. Yeah, and uh, well, I think I'm going to give you the stage. And after that, we're going to talk about, well, audience questions, of course, and maybe s take a sneak peek at yesterday's party and your concert. I'm thinking about that, okay? All right. <laughs> okay, have fun. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So I'm on a massive cinema stage, like, like you've gone to the movies and the movie is me, which is awesome because I love movies. And uh, big hello to all the folks who are out there watching on the stream. I have the Pine Tool chat open. So if you have any questions or comments or just drop a message in chat, say hello. Let me know where you're all tuning in from. Uh, folks in Vilnius, I know where you're tuning in from. You don't need to get your phone up and put messages in chat. And uh, yeah, all of you have come to a talk called Plain Text. But actually, I've kind of changed the talk a little bit. Because the talk is really, there is no such thing as plain text, right? Because uh, you say to developers, what do you think about text? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Do we have an opinion about text? And you, ask, and you ask them like tabs versus spaces, they'll talk to you for hours. But you say, hey, what do you think of text? They're like, I guess text probably is probably okay. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, this is me, Dylan Beatty. I run Ursatile, which is an online training uh, software company and consultancy, which I run out of my home office studio here in the, the beautiful city of London. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I run the London.net user group. And I once invented a programming language as a joke that got so popular that now I'm the project manager of the joke. And it's a joke with a formal test suite. It is the programming language called Rockstar. So if you ever want to go on LinkedIn and apply for all those sweet Rockstar programmer jobs that you find, uh, go to codewithrockstar.com. Type in some code, click rock, and if it works, and it will work because it's a very easy language to learn, then you are a rock star programmer. And yeah, I'm going to talk to you about plain text. And, uh, you know, like I said, text is one of these things. Developers, we're surrounded by text all the time. Like, uh, you know, we, we work in a world where our source code files are text and our YAML files are text and our HTML is actually text. And you never really stop to think about the actual text very much. Now, you know, human beings, we invented uh, all these amazing things we can do with technology, but really technology is about enabling communication between people. You got one person over here and they, they have an idea, they think of something. And they're like, I wanna do something with this idea and the technology. And so we have three challenges. Almost all information software is about solving three challenges. First of all, how do you get the interesting thing in tech technology? Second, once it's in there, what are you gonna do with it? You can sort it, index it, compress it, send it to Australia, stream it live over the internet, like we're doing right now. And then third, how do you get it back out at the other end so that somebody else can go, hey, yeah, I like that. That's a good idea. Now, human beings, we've been using writing, which is you know, a very primitive form of technology. Uh, we've been using writing to communicate and share ideas for probably about 5,000 years since, you know, ancient uh, Babylonia and, and Mesopotamia. But things kind of didn't get interesting until about 150 years ago when someone had the bright idea, hey, what if we combine this writing thing we invented and we combine that with electricity? And they came up with this, the Cook and Wheatstone Telegraph System. Now, this was first used in uh, England in about the 18th 30s, 1840s. And uh, it is the first instance anywhere in history of people using electricity to transmit text. Now, this is older than telephones, older than broadband, older than mobile phones. You gotta remember, you know, this isn't a day when if you wanted to send a message from here to somebody over there, um, you sent it on a horse because that was how it worked. And then uh, these guys, Cook and Wheatstone, they came along and they invented this thing. They took five wires 
and they ran those five wires a distance of about 20 kilometers between two big railway stations just outside London in the UK. And uh, the way the Cook and Wheatstone system worked, um, there were these two people. So Cook was a, was a businessman and Wheatstone was a scientist. And uh, Cook insisted that this thing had to be user-friendly and you shouldn't have to read the manual. And Wheatstone's there going, we've literally invented the telegraph system. Surely people can do some basic training. And Cook is going, we must sell this for a whole bunch of money. And Wheatstone is going, no, our invention should be free and we should give it away to the whole world because it'll make people's lives better. So that's just like every kind of commercial versus open source project that I've ever worked on. And every product manager who's like, oh no, you've got to be able to use our product without reading the manual, all this kind of stuff. This is the solution that they came up with a five dial telegraph system. And if you wanted to send someone a letter, what you did is uh, you in, in Paddington station here, you would connect two of those wires. So you created a circuit, positive and then negative coming back. And that circuit would cause two of these needles to deflect. And then you would read on the dial, where do those needles cross? And that would tell you which letter was being sent. Now, anytime you're working with ASCII or Unicode and you're thinking, oh, why have we got this eight bit system here? Just take a moment because this, was the first encoding system. And this is what we could have ended up stuck with. This is a five symbol trinary encoding system where you got five symbols and one of them is positive, one of them is negative, and the others are all neutral. So uh, maybe we, we dodged a little bit of a bullet there. And in retrospect, I think 8-bit is much easier to work with. Now, the problem with the five wire telegraph system is that one of the wires stopped working. And then they're like, well, we could replace the wire but that'd be really expensive. Maybe we can do the same thing with four wires. And then one of those wires burned out and three wires and two wires. Meanwhile, over the other side of the Atlantic in America, a guy called Samuel Morse, whose name you may recognize, uh, he was skipping the whole thing. He's like, we're just gonna build a system that uses one single wire to send telegraph messages. And he came up with, well, Actually, he didn't come up with this. He came up with an earlier version of this. Um, this, which is international Morse code, was actually invented in uh, Germany. It was a guy called Friedrich Gecker who uh, developed this during the 1850s and 1860s and then standardized it. In 1865, there was a uh, technology conference in Paris, and uh, basically a whole bunch of telegraph networks from all these different countries, they all said, yes, this is international Morse code, and we are going to use this system. Now, over the next couple of decades, telegraph networks sprung up everywhere, basically connected the entire world with Morse code telegraph systems. Now, one of the things you know about software, right, is when no one is using your product, you can do anything you like. Change this, remove that, change your encoding, change your file formats or your data structures. When you have users, you can't change anything because the users complain. And so international Morse code kind of got set in stone. It took 100 years for people to finally go, maybe Morse code is not the best encoding system for text. And the thing that finally kind of tipped it over the edge was the computer, because computers do not do Morse code very well, because Morse code is a time-based coding system. If you hear beep, is that a dot or a dash? Well, you don't know. You need to know if it's beep, 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 or beep, 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 beep. You need to know how fast it's going. And computers are not or were not very good at that in the 60s. So the Americans, the uh, American Standards Association, which now became, uh, later became known as ANSI, and they're still out there today, they published the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. ASCII. And we still use ASCII every day. And the thing you've got to realize about ASCII is that it was designed by smart people to solve a particular set of problems. One of those problems was it had to work on mechanical teleprinters. Second, it had to work with punch cards. And the third one we're going to talk about in a second. Let's have a little, we're going to do a little tour of ASCII because a lot of people, you've never actually looked at ASCII and looked at how it's put together. So, We've got the bottom block of ASCII here, characters uh, 0 through 31. Now, these were all control codes. These are codes that control your mechanical teleprinter. And so at the top there, we got 0, which is the null character, which all you have to write C and C++. You know all about nulls, right? Um, then you've got a start of heading. You've got a start of text. Now, if you wanted to type these control codes, use the key with control, CTRL, written on it. And so if you wanted to send a start of heading, you pressed control A. And if you wanted to send a start of text, you press control B. And if your teleprinter was just printing loads of stuff and you're like, stop, don't, don't print any more things, you would send control C, which is end of text. And that one we still use today. And I probably still use that every single day when I accidentally forget to terminate a loop or something. Now we got to end a transmission. We've got inquiry. Um, ASCII number seven, 
that's the bell. And if you type on a Windows machine, echo, space, control G, and then press enter, it'll go ping, because that's ringing the bell on your teleprinter. And then we get into uh, this, this little range here of horizontal tabs and line feeds and vertical tabs and all that kind of stuff. Now, here's the thing you've got to realize about teleprinters. One, plain text is really cool. But also, on a mechanical teleprinter, you have this thing here, which is called the carriage. And when you get to the end of a line, you need to return the carriage to the start of the line, and then you need to feed the paper through the roller by one line. So a carriage return line feed was two separate operations. Why was it separate? Well, because sometimes you didn't want to use both of them. Sometimes you wanted to print a line of text, but then you just wanted to make like a bold effect because you couldn't do bold. These were, you know, mechanical uh, typewriter style printers, but you could print the same line again and get this kind of bold effect. And to do that, you needed to send a carriage return without any new line. And so there were applications that said, we cannot combine these things together. Now, today we still have all these headaches about should we use a, a slash n or should we use slash r slash n? Because Linux and Mac OS, they say slash n is a new line, and the Windows world says slash r slash n is a new line. Now, the reason why this happened is that uh, Linux and the Mac OS and Android, they all evolved out of Unix, and Unix evolved out of Multics. And Multics was the first operating system in history that had device drivers. There was actually, you could put some code between your, your files and your data structures and your physical devices. And so they were the ones that said, look, if we see a slash n, do a carriage return as well. They had a translation layer built into the device driver that let them do that. Windows, Windows 10 evolved out of Windows 8, and Windows 8 evolved out of Windows 7, and all the way back to Windows NT, which came out of Windows 95, which came out of MS-DOS, which came out of CPM, kind of. And that was designed to run on the cheapest computers you could find because they wanted to sell it to lots of businesses with limited budgets. And so they didn't have any device drivers. They ran on mini computers. And if you wanted to send a carriage return new line, you sent a carriage return and then you sent a new line. Of course, uh, today, most of us just use environment.newline. And, and when we deploy to production, we hope it works. Now, the next chunk here, there's some really clever stuff. This is the, the punctuation marks. And one of the interesting things about ASCII is they had to choose what to include. Now, if you've ever worked in typography or book publishing, you know that there's not just a minus. There's a dash, there's a minus sign, there's an M dash, there's an N dash. They are all different typographic symbols. ASCII just went, now. Nah, we'll just use one, just a little horizontal line. And that was kind of good enough for a long time until lots of us started getting retina displays and ebook readers. And uh, last kind of five, 10 years, we've seen a real resurgence of typography on the web and on you know, authoring platforms and stuff. So there's you know, some decisions they had to make about what punctuation to include there. Now, the digits, the decimal digits, one of the things we do a lot with computers is we turn numbers into text and we turn text back into numbers because that's how humans read and write stuff. And to do that in ASCII, all you do is you ignore the top half. You just ignore the, the top half of the, the sequence there. Actually, it's not quite half because proper ASCII is only seven bits. And that just gives you the binary representation of that digit, which is really fast, even on a four-bit microprocessor. You can do that really, really quickly. Then we get into the alphabet. Now, you ever looked at ASCII and been like, well, that's weird. Why is uppercase A 65 and lowercase A is 97? Like, why did they pick those numbers? Well, the reason is, if you want to do a case insensitive string comparison in ASCII, all you have to do is you turn off the sixth bit. Turn off that one there, and uppercase and lowercase end up being the same. And then you can just do uh, you know, a standard numeric sort, and you'll get things in alphabetical order, but it doesn't care about uppercase versus lowercase letters. We have a bunch more. We have vertical bars and closing braces and tilts. And finally, right at the end of the bottom ASCII block, we have this, delete. One, 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 one. You know why delete is all of the ones? Think about a punch card. It's a piece of cardboard with holes punched in it. You can't fill the holes back in. If you want to erase a punch card, what you need is you just wipe out every single hole so you have no idea what was on it before. That's why ASCII delete is code 127. And so the Americans, they slap themselves on the back and they go, hey, good job. We've solved it. We've solved text encoding. And the rest of the world goes, what? We can't work with this because what they've done, of course, is they solved the text encoding problems that occurred in written American English in 1965. And uh, as we all know, there is a lot more to uh, human culture and literature and language than the stuff which existed in a written form in America in 1965. Now, my first experience of this was this thing here, the 
the pound sign. Now, I grew up in Zimbabwe, where you know I grew up speaking English and uh, working in dollars and cents. So I didn't realize this was a problem until I moved to the UK when I was about 10 years old, and I was trying to print some homework. And I pressed print, and uh, I could not print a pound sign because my computer and my printer, they couldn't agree on what a pound sign was because the Americans hadn't told them how to solve it. Now, this was just one example for me. There were some uh, you know, Western European languages and alphabets that were like, we can almost work with this, but not quite. There were some places out there that were like, we can't even like our entire alphabet. It's just not even available on this platform here. And so a lot of people looked at this and they went, well, hang on. ASCII is only 127 characters. That's only seven bits. Uh, what about this bit? Could we use this bit? And of course, because nobody was standardizing that bit, loads of companies, countries, organizations went, hey, we've got a brilliant idea. Now, when you work in IT a little while, eventually you'll come across something called a code page. That's what a code page is. A code page is a set of rules for interpreting the top half of eight bit ASCII. And one of the most successful code pages ever was this one. It's code page 437, which shipped with the IBM PC in the early 1980s. Now, uh, if you look at the second half of this block of characters here, IBM, they wanted to support Western European languages. So they included most of the accented characters for doing uh, you know, Swedish, Norwegian, French, uh, those kinds of languages. They included a bunch of box drawing characters so you could draw menu systems. They included half of the Greek alphabet. You know why it's half? They didn't care about Greek, they cared about physics. And so they included the characters from the Greek alphabet that were necessary for doing mathematical and physics formulae, but not enough to actually send you know, emails in Greek and stuff. And they did something else that's interesting is they went, the IBM PC is not a mechanical teleprinter. We don't need control codes. We can reuse that bottom block for little smiley faces and playing cards and arrows and all that kind of stuff. And so if you've ever seen an IBM PC crash really, really hard, which I'm sure some of you will have done over the years, you get a screen of noise and you look at the noise and it's little smiley faces and playing cards. And that's why these are lower ASCII control codes being interpreted by the code page 437. Now, some of you probably recognize uh, this. This is the, the Cyrillic alphabet. This is uh, the Cyrillic alphabet code page. And uh, there was an international standard for writing Cyrillic, you know, Russian, Ukrainian, Bulgarian, uh, using code pages, but it didn't work terribly well. Now, the reason why it didn't work is uh, you take a word like uh, Privyet, which is Russian means hello, hi. And then you turn that into ASCII, but then quite a lot of systems, they would lose the eighth bit because they thought no one was using it. So they'd use it, email systems would strip it off, word processors would use it for parity checks, those kinds of things. And then when you turn Privyet back into ASCII, you get nonsense out and no one has any idea what it is. Uh, so the Russians, they came up with the uh, Code of Nema Informatia Vosembit, which was their own encoding. And I think this is brilliant. The way that this worked, it didn't respect Cyrillic alphabetical order. It respected the similar characters. What sounds like the character that we're trying to encode? So you take Privret, you turn it into ASCII, you lose the eighth bit in transmission, but when you get it back at the other end, you get Privret. Except it's flipped. The capital letters are back with uh, lowercase and vice versa. And that's how you can tell this thing's been garbled, but you can still read it. And I just think that is a really, really brilliantly clever idea. Now. These text encoding problems, they crop up in all kinds of weird places. In uh, 2002, uh, there was this uh, famous in text encoding circles, so not really famous at all. Um, <coughs> but there's this, uh, this woman, Claudette, who is in France, and she's got a, a pen friend in Moscow, um, Svetlana. And uh, they're talking on email about Harry Potter books and stuff. And uh, Claudette says, hey, do you want me to send you the new Harry Potter book? And so uh, Sveta sends her this email saying, hey, Claudette, that would be great. We can't get Harry Potter in Russia yet. Um, here's my address. It's in Russian, so copy it down carefully. And then she wrote her address, a street address here in Moscow. But of course, when Claudette opened the email, she opened it on a machine that was using a Western European encoding and got this. And so she followed the instructions and she copied this very carefully. Now, if you look, at the encodings here, we got two different code pages. We got the KOI8 encoding, and we got the ISO 8859 encoding. The same string of values comes out as completely different letters, but Claudette follows the instructions, and she very carefully copies that onto an envelope, puts the Harry Potter book in, and posts it to Russia. And somebody in the Russian postal service looks at this and goes, I know what's going on here, and they figure it out. 
and they decode it and it gets delivered. And uh, yeah, so ingenuity there in terms of text encoding using a red biro by the Russian post office, which I think is quite cool. And there's one more place where this still crops up today. Uh, in 1987, Billy Joel played a concert in uh, what was then Leningrad, a city is now called St. Petersburg. Um, and they released that in the Soviet Union on vinyl and they called it, now some of you can read that, that says concert in Cyrillic, right? But the databases where the record companies recorded all of their stuff, they didn't really support the Russian alphabet. And so this got entered in as Kohuept, which was kind of the closest match they could come up with on a, a Western keyboard. And that name stuck. And if you go on iTunes right now and type in Kohuept, you'll find this. Billy Joel, Kohuept, live in Leningrad. It survives to this day because we're never going to be able to fix that now. Now, there are a lot of these code pages, uh, different companies, different organizations. You go on Wikipedia now, you'll see this is just the list of different code pages that they know about. You know, IBM came up with a bunch, Microsoft came up with some, Apple came up with some. There were PostScript code pages and Xerox code pages. And we kind of got away with this for a while until we invented the web and email and everyone started sending electronic documents backwards and forwards. And the thing just became chaotic. We needed a, a unified coding system. We needed Unicode. Now, the Unicode project was started in 1988. Uh, the Unicode Consortium, which is the body that kind of you know, controls Unicode, uh, that was founded in 1991. And their mission statement is to provide a single consistent way to represent each letter and symbol needed for all human languages across all computers and devices. Now, there's three important points there. We're going to take them backwards. First of all, all computers and devices. Well, if you want everyone in the world to use your solution, you got to do two things. You got to make it really good and you got to make it free. And they did. You know, Unicode actually succeeded in this. They came up with what I think is a really, really clever encoding system. No license fees, nothing. Anyone who wants to can use it. All human languages, you know, not just the modern ones, though, uh, also things like ancient Sumerian, Egyptian hieroglyphics, because there are archaeologists out there doing research and they want to send emails about the stuff they're working on. And a single consistent way to represent each letter and symbol. Well, are these the same, these two strings? Take a look at them for a second. Do you think, do these strings, are they, are they equivalent? Well, one of them is Cyrillic. It's the Russian word Horosha. The other one is the middle of the English word exoplanet. Now, this gets us into some really complicated questions. Are they the same letter of the alphabet? Are they the same letter of a different alphabet? If they stand for the same sound, do we treat them the same? Now, I'm British. I speak British English, which means I think I can read this word because my brain just kind of filters out these bits and it thinks that they're decoration. They're not. These are different letters of the alphabet. But in British English, my brain just spits them out and goes, no, 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 that clearly says half owner. And it doesn't. It says a half owner. It's a Norwegian word for hairdryer. If you ask for a half owner, everyone laughs at you. And then you buy them some beer and everything's fine because in Norway, buying someone a beer is kind of like buying them a house. But this gets us to the interesting question of, you know, how do we decide which alphabet to use? Let's meet some friends of mine. This is uh, Francois Borda, who's a, an archeologist from France. And uh, this is the rock band Motley Crue from Los Angeles. And uh, Francois, the archeologist went to the Motley Crue concert. Now this sentence is clearly written in English, but there are four things in here which are not letters of the English alphabet, right? We got the little C with a sedia, we've got the A, E uh, joined together there in a ligature, and then we've got the O and the U, which are heavy metal umlauts. Um, now, Motley Crue put those there because they thought they looked cool. And then the first time they toured in Germany, everyone was chanting, Mertle Crue, Mertle Crue, and they're like, why can't they pronounce our name? It's like, no, you can't write your own name. Now, making Motley Crue look stupid, they kind of look stupid anyway, right? But sometimes there can be real implications for these kinds of alphabets and encoding errors. Uh, some of you may know Magnus. Uh, Magnus, Ma actually, not Magnus Martinson, Magnus Mortensen, because the second letter of Magnus' surname is O, which is the 27th letter of the Swedish alphabet, uh, because Magnus is Swedish. And a couple of years ago, Magnus is on his way to the United States to attend a developer conference there, and he's traveling on a Swedish passport. And the rules of Swedish orthography say, um, you look at your passport, there's this little strip at the bottom. That has to be ASCII. That has to be a uh, standard seven-bit ASCII. And the Swedish authorities say that if you have the letter O, you replace that with AA, you double it up. But the people who printed Magnus Airline ticket, they didn't care. They just took the little circle off the top. And so Magnus finds himself trying to get into the United States with a passport that does not exactly match what is printed on his airline ticket. 
Now, as you know, the American border authorities are very knowledgeable and forgiving people, and uh, he had to answer some, some complicated questions. They let him through in the end. But, you know, he's a, a, a well-dressed, well-spoken white guy on his way to a developer conference at Microsoft. Imagine how that would have played out differently if he'd been somebody else, right? And if you think that's crazy, we are just getting warmed up here. Let's have a look at a list of cities, Berlin, Aachen, Zurich, Orchus, and Erbro. Now, we're going to put these in a SQL Server database. And we are going to put that data in and we are going to do a select star. We get our list of cities back. That's good. That's what we're expecting. And now we are going to find Erebro in our list of cities and it's not there. And we look at it for a second. Oh, maybe it's, it's a capital versus lowercase. Let's try it with a, a uppercase O and it's still not there. This is weird. Maybe, hang on. Let's say if, if Erebro equals Orbro, now are these the same or not? If those two things are equal, print yes, else print no, no, they are not the same. They're not the same because we have not told the database how it should be comparing different characters. If we say, please compare these two strings using the Latin one, general case insensitive, CI, accent insensitive, AI, that collation, it comes back and it goes, yeah, if you ignore cases and accents, those strings are the same. Now, collation is not just about are they equal, collation is also about alphabetical order. If I select star from cities order by name, what I get back at the other side of this, I get uh, this, Aachen, Arcus, Berlin, Arbro, Zurich, which is what you expect if you're a British or American English speaker. If we do the same thing using the rules of Finnish and Swedish orthography, we get Aachen, Arcus, Berlin, Zurich, but then Arbro at the end, because Ur is the 29th letter of the Swedish and Finnish alphabet. It is not just O with two dots at the top. It's a different letter of the alphabet. And if we do the same thing using the Danish and Norwegian collation, suddenly Aachen and Orhus have moved to the end of the alphabet. Because these are the rules of Danish and Norwegian orthography is, uh, well, actually it gets way more complicated than this. Because the rules say that anything in Scandinavia that starts with an AA goes at the end of the list. So this list is not actually correct. Orhus should be at the end, but Aachen shouldn't because Aachen is not in Scandinavia, it's in Germany. Now, if you've won, if you've ever wondered why Norwegian language Windows puts Advark at the end of the list of files, that's why. But the city of Orhus, second city in Denmark, um, is a fascinating example of this because uh, Orhus was known as Orhus, from 1948 till January 2011. It changed its spelling and then it changed it back. It changed it in 1948 as part of something called the Danish spelling reform. Uh, after World War II, Denmark went, we're gonna try and be a little bit less German, a little bit more Swedish. You can probably figure out why they did that. And so they added these three letters to the end of their alphabet and they went, anything that used to be AA, which is R at the beginning, we're now gonna spell that with the new letter R. Um, and that goes at the end of the alphabet. So this list of cities is in Danish alphabetical order. But then in 2011, the people of Aarhus voted to change the name of the city the spelling of the city back to its ASCII form so that you could find it more easily on things like TripAdvisor, I think was, was one of the reasons. And so we ended up with this list, but it doesn't go back to the beginning of the alphabet. This is in Danish and Norwegian alphabetical order. Aachen is at the beginning, Aarhus is at the end, and you're looking at this and you're thinking, but that's impossible. Like there is not enough data in the data to know that that is the order these things go. And how does the database know whether this city is in Scandinavia or not? Well, it doesn't. If you have to solve this problem, you are going to need to cheat or you're going to need to override. You're going to need to add another column to your data, which is the sorting key so that if something doesn't go where you think alphabetical order puts it, you can go in and you can override that. And what this kind of just goes to show, you know, a lot of people out there are like, ah, oh, well, you know, I just work on technology. I don't really care about history and politics. And it's like, no, 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 no. Technology exists to solve problems that were created by history and politics. If you don't understand the history and the politics, then the technology is not going to make any sense because you won't understand what it was that they were trying to accomplish with it. Now, let's take a look at C. Let's see with a little CDR underneath. How are we going to encode this? Because it's not part of ASCII. And we've already decided that code pages are a bad idea. So when it comes to Unicode, we got a choice. We can draw this as a Unicode 00C7. That's one character. It's a letter of the, the French alphabet. Or we can take a regular ASCII flavored C and we can put a 0327, which is a combining CDR after it. And that'll draw the little tail on it. And it turns out that these combining characters in Unicode, they're brilliant because we can just stick them on all over the place. We can take one of these and add one of those and one of those and one of those and one of those and stick one of those on. And when we finished, we get 
Zalgo text, which you'll see popping up on uh, internet forums all over the place. Now, <coughs> let's take a look at our old friends Motley Crue. Now, we could write Motley Crue like this, but we could also write Motley Crue like this with these combining, uh, called combining diuresis characters, heavy metal umlauts. And uh, the question here is, are these the same string or not? Now, again, Unicode doesn't say yes, they are or no, they're not. It says you got to choose. Here are the choices we give you. And uh, the choices that it gives us, this little code snippet here, which is, uh, yeah, this is the Java version. We've got these four normalizer forms, NFC, uh, NFD, NFKC, and NFKD. Now, C there stands for composed. NFC is normalization form composed. That means squash this thing down into the smallest number of code points you can. And decompose means stretch this thing out into the biggest number of code points you can. And then the K stands for canonical. And what canonical means is forget uh, what it looks like, tell us what it says. So let's take a look at an example here. Um, if we take uh, Motley Crue there, and then we have Motley Crue as well, but this time we're building it up with combining characters. And uh, we run a little compilation across that, and we compare those two things. We're going to run them with a Java compiler with the UTF-8 encoding, which is important. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And when we run that, we get this. Although those two strings are not binary equivalent, they are considered equal under all four different kinds of Unicode normalization. Take a look at this. This is the string plain text and the string plain text, but one of them is in little bubbles so that it looks cool in your Twitter profile. And if we run these through the same thing, Java encoding UTF-8, and then we run it and we get, no, no, no. So what it says here, they're not binary equivalent and they are not equivalent unless you apply canonical comparison. So these two strings, they're different. They're different strings. But if you imagine you're trying to search a database where people have used fancy Unicode and their usernames and stuff, you need to use a canonical composition form to be able to find those people's names. Now, uh, I mentioned the first turning point in my own journey with text encoding was uh, when I was 10 years old, I was trying to print my homework and pound signs didn't work and I had to learn about code pages. The second turning point in my personal journey with text encoding was when I went into work one day a couple of years back and uh, somebody came over to my desk and I said, dude, I think we've been hacked. Now, you know, when you work in software, people are constantly saying we've been hacked because they don't know how computers work and they've accidentally done a right click view source and now they think someone's hacking their Facebook and stuff. Um, but this person had credibility. This person was a, a very, very good security engineer. And I sort of said, why do you think we've been hacked? There is Chinese in the Windows event logs. And I opened the Windows event logs and sure enough, there is Chinese in them. And so, you know, I do what managers do. I say to one person, right, you go and check all the firewall logs, see if we got any suspicious activity. You search the rest of the database, see if there's Chinese in any of the columns, any data, you know, is this an injection attack or something? You go and tell everyone we're looking into a weird problem with it, which means I got nothing to do because that's the art of good management is to delegate all of the important work. So I sit there and I post about it on Twitter. And it turns out that's what solved the problem because somebody immediately replied with, uh, oh, that looks like a Unicode mapping error and then fake Unicode which is a really fun Twitter account to follow, they pop up and say, yeah, this is UTF-16 LE being mistaken for BE or vice versa. And I look at this and I'm like, right, I should probably learn really quickly what LE and BE are. Uh, so I do about an hour of very, very intensive reading and Googling and research. And this is what I learned that morning. Internally, Windows and also Java, JavaScript, Android, they represent almost everything as a 16. They use a thing called UTF-16. Every character is two bytes. And this is just because operating systems are much faster if all the characters are the same size. And so they use 16 bits for just about everything. And uh, this is where it gets interesting, because if you've got a character represented as two bytes, you need to know which way around they go. And it turns out if you take the word delete, which you'll find in database logs, and you flip it so that it's the wrong way around, what you get at the other end is Chinese, the exact Chinese that we were seeing in the event logs. So the next question is, well, why are our Windows event logs being flipped from big end to little end? Well, turns out they weren't. Turns out what actually happened is there was a faulty network switch in the, the virtual cluster thing that was hosting our, our stack that was dropping one byte that every two or three minutes, it would drop a byte. And when it did, everything else in that stream got shuffled sideways. And then when it put it back together at the other end, what comes out is Chinese. Now, UTF-16, like I said, it works internally for operating systems as long as you don't get it the wrong way around. It has a lot of advantages there. But when it comes to something like the web, let's take a look at this uh, web page. Very simple web page. This just says, uh, Privet, in Ukrainian this time. Um, now, even though the actual content of this page is written using the Ukrainian Cyrillic alphabet, 
it's a web page. It's made of ASCII, angle brackets and HTML tags and attributes and all that kind of stuff. And so if you take a UTF-16 encoding of this, these are the bits that need UTF-16. Everything else here is ASCII with a bunch of extra space writing alongside it. In fact, 44% of this document is null bytes. And we still have to send them because we have to send the original byte stream. Otherwise, you can't put it back together. Now, clearly, this is not an effective use of bandwidth. And so the Unicode Consortium came up with what I think is one of the most brilliant hacks ever invented, UTF-8. Now, the way UTF-8 works, any byte that starts with zeros or starts with a zero, that's seven bit ASCII. But if the byte starts with a one, this is part of a multi byte encoding sequence. And if it starts with a one zero, you are in the middle of a character right now. You need to rewind. You need to back it up until you find a one one or a one 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 or a one 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 one. And that's how you know you're at the start of a letter. And then you work forwards from there until you get to the next one one. You're like, okay, now I have the letter. Now I can take out the red bits. I can decode those. That'll give me the Unicode code point. UTF 8 is just a wonderfully brilliant hack. All the stuff that's been ASCII since 1965, that's still ASCII, but also it's Unicode now. It's UTF-8. It's completely valid UTF-8. But this gives us a huge amount of space to play with. You know, we can encode all the alphabets of all the languages and cultures that exist anywhere in the world, and it gives us space to invent new languages. And you're thinking, but what do you mean invent new languages? Do we still do that? And well, we do. There is a language invented in my lifetime that I bet good money all of you have used in the last 24 hours. It is the language called emoji. And emoji was invented in Japan in uh, about 1998. Uh, There's a company called Docomo, big Japanese mobile phone company, uh, created a project called iMode, which was you know weather forecasts and transport network timetables and things sent straight to your phone. And uh, this was a massive hit in Japan. Within about a year, you could not buy a mobile phone in Japan that didn't have emoji support. And that meant that when Apple released iPhone in Japan in 2008, they had to include emoji, otherwise no one would want it. And then the rest of the world suddenly figures out, hey, if I set my keyboard layout to Japanese, I can send emoji. And everyone else is like, dude, where'd you get these sick little emotion characters? And you show them the Japanese thing and suddenly, boom, emoji is everywhere. The whole world is using it. And people start asking questions like, why is there sushi, but there's no tacos? Um, you know, why, where's the, why have we got all these flags, but the flag of Palestine is missing? Why are all of the occupations men? And why are they all that kind of Simpsons yellow color? And you know, these are valid questions. People want to use emoji to communicate about who they are and what they're, they're trying to do with their lives. Now, let's take a look here. In a couple of years ago, Unicode made a massive step forward in terms of you know, inclusivity and, and supporting uh, the way people want to communicate. And they did it by saying, well, let's take the characters we've got, like the thumbs up sign, but then we are going to use combining characters, just like we did for accents in uh, foreign alphabets. And we're going to say, well, what if you combine this with this? And that will give you a dark skin tone, thumbs up. And you know this is using technology that's already part of the standard with a new set of modifier code points. Now, every year at the moment, Unicode releases a bunch of new stuff. They're like, these are the new emoji that are coming. They don't create artwork for all of these. They do it using a combination of tricks. One of them is, uh, you want to send a female astronaut emoji? You send the emoji for a woman, then you send a, send a thing called a zwidge, a zero width joiner, and then you send a rocket ship. And if your handset or your device supports it, it'll combine those into a female astronaut emoji. And if you want to send uh, Mae Jameson, who flew the space shuttle and looks like this, you can send woman plus dark skin tone plus a zero width joiner plus rocket, and you get that emoji at the other end if your device supports it. Now, flags are interesting. The, the flag of Lithuania in emoji is encoded as two letters from a specific alphabetic set of the alphabet there. We've got the regional symbol indicator letter L and letter T. Now, if your device supports it, that'll draw the flag of Lithuania. And this works for the flags that are acknowledged as countries by ISO. England is not. The flag of England is not a country flag, according to ISO, because England is part of Great Britain or the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So if you want to send the flag of England, you send a black flag, and then you send a bunch of tags. You send G, B, E, N, G, which is from a separate block of the Unicode code space. And uh, this will give you the flag of England. And you can also do Scotland and Wales. And if you send USTX, you get the flag of Texas. Those are the ones that are in there at the moment. And if you want to send the pride flag, you send a white flag, a zero-width joiner, and a rainbow. 
Now, uh, take a look at this flag here. Anyone recognize this flag? This is the flag of the Republic of China, the country that most people know as Taiwan. And uh, on mainland China, which is the People's Republic of China, this flag is, is controversial and you can be uh, get into some trouble because they don't like this flag being, being flown anywhere. Now, this caused some problems when Apple wanted to sell iPhones in China. And so what they did is you can go on your iPhone right now. You can put in the flag of Taiwan. You can go into your regional settings. You can change your area to China mainland. Go back into your tweet that you're composing. And what you'll notice is that the flag of Taiwan has disappeared and it no longer appears in your emoji set. That was Apple's solution to how to sell iPhones in China without upsetting anybody. Windows looked at this situation when we're not even picking a site here. If you go onto, say, my Twitter profile right now, um, I got this little EU flag in there. Now, if you look at the Twitter web interface, you'll see the flag, but that's a PNG. That's being drawn by Twitter's interface. If you're on Windows and you look at that as text, what you get is EU. These are regional symbol indicators because Windows doesn't have any flags. Actually, it's not that Windows doesn't have any flags in it. Windows has the pirate flag, skull and crossbones, and it has the pride flag. So the only flags that are allowed on Windows are if you want to use flags to show someone you're a gay pirate, which I think, you know, as position statements go, it's not bad. Now then, <laughs> a couple of years ago, I uh, had the pleasure of visiting uh, Ukraine and Russia and Belarus. And uh, this my first trip actually was build stuff the first time they went to, to Kiev a few years back. Um, and I loved it. And I kept going back and I applied for a bunch of conferences. I got to do loads of travel in the former Soviet Union. And I just, it completely blew my mind. I absolutely loved the place. And I remember walking around on my first visit there and thinking, this is weird. I can't read anything. Like I can't read the restaurant menus. I can't read the, um, you know, the road signs, all that kind of stuff. But I can read all the license plates on the cars. And I thought, you know, why in Ukraine and Belarus are the license plates written in English? Now, I did some digging and I found a thing called the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic from 1965, which was this big international treaty and all the countries that signed it, including the Soviet Union, said, yes, we promise that if you drive across a border, we will use only the Latin alphabet, the English alphabet on our license plates. Now, in 1965, license plates in the Soviet Union looked like this. Um, now, apparently, it was not a problem uh, having the wrong license plates because you could not drive your car out of the Soviet Union in 1965. It's just not a thing that happened. And if you could get the papers and you were allowed to do that, then they would give you temporary license plates at the border and you'd better bring them back. But when the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s, all of those former Soviet states, they overhauled their vehicle registration systems. And now their license plates look like this. And the really interesting hack here is what they did is they took the Cyrillic alphabet and they took the Latin alphabet and they identified the set of not letters, the set of glyphs, the set of shapes that occur in both of those languages. And it just so happens that if you take that set of letters and you shuffle them around a little bit, it spells this. It spells Pike Matchbox. And so the next time somebody says to you, hey, I'm going to send you a plain text file, or yeah, the files are all plain text, you turn to them real carefully and you say, do you know about Pike Matchbox? And if they say, oh, yeah, I know Pike Matchbox, then they've seen this talk and they know about Big Endian and Little Endian and code points and teleprinters and the flag of Taiwan and Motley Crue and all these little quirks of encoding. And they are probably going to send you a text file, which you are going to be able to open because they've considered things like uh, encoding formats and uh, emojis and those kinds of stuff. But if they say, no, I don't know, well, what's this Pike Matchbox thing, then hang on to your hat because you have no idea what they are going to send you that they think is plain text. Thank you, Build Stuff. If you have any questions, uh, stick them in the chat or put your hand up and shout out. I think we have some people on site out there who are going to be wrangling questions. Wrangling questions. E and I'm sticking around for a few. Hey, Agna. Hey, Agna. Hey, hey, hey. Do we have anyone in the audience who wants to chat with Dylan? Not yet. Dylan, you've been at the party. You was the star of the party. You know that people are not going to talk to you today. <laughs> hey, I was on stage, except I wasn't on stage. I was here. And all this is two hours earlier for me. So for you, it's like you've had a nice lion. For, but uh, for me, it, it's only just 10 o'clock in the morning here. So because it's time travel. You know, I'm, I'm literally speaking to you from the past right now. <laughs> or maybe the future. All right. 
we've achieved complete enlightenment, haven't we? Everyone's like, wow, I understand everything. I have no more questions. I was more okay. likely to I was more likely to assume that everybody understood nothing and they had no questions. That happens more often. <laughs> anyway, uh, speaking about the party, we have a tiny bit of uh, well, I, I asked before only half of people that I see in the audience right now were in the party actually, and uh, so we decided to show just a little tiny bit of what you did yesterday. Uh, can we have that on the screen right now? It's amazing what you can do with technology, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you you look like, uh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 maybe years ago, there was that Gorillaz concert where they all appeared as holograms, literally looking like you just did. <laughs> anyway. Um, Damon Alban being a cartoon character. But, uh, <laughs> cool. All right, let's wrap this up. You're I need to go and host. Oh, really? Not yet. You have yeah. 10 minutes. I know your scenario. I know your, your timetable. <laughs> yeah, but if I'm not there 10 minutes early, everyone gets upset and I get frightened messages on WhatsApp going, where are you? So I don't want to freak people out, you know? It's a very serious hey, do you have, hosting hybrid concept. Do you, have a, do you have a minute to answer Clifford question? Yeah. What's yeah. the question? Okay, I can read it to you. Uh, how did you match the ah, music no. playing for the party? Yeah, delays the must have been oh, a the chat bleep. Open, but it's not scrolling, because still after 18 months of virtual conferences, they haven't worked out how to make a chat system that scrolls. Um, how did you match the music playing for the party? So uh, the secret with the delays is you ignore them. So I was playing here. So I, had the, I was sending the guitar and the drums and the video and the vocals. And I was just streaming them on YouTube with a, a low latency stream, but I couldn't hear anything coming back the other way. So I couldn't hear the rest of the band. So they just had to kind of hang on and keep up as best they could. And uh, from the video, they did a fantastic job of that. But uh, yeah, there was a couple of bits when we did Piano Man, I couldn't hear the piano. So I had to play the whole song just to the drums and kind of keep track with the, the lyrics of, of where it was and everything. So uh, it wasn't terribly easy, but at this point, we've all had a lot of practice adapting technology and doing, doing online things in interesting ways. Um, so yeah, it, the, the secret with delays is you can't solve them, so don't even try. Just come up with a different system, different way of thinking about it. It's eventual consistency. By the time it gets to the audience, everything kind of lines up. Just don't expect anything coming back the other way. <laughs> To be honest, I don't know, it, it feels for me like you went through nine circles of hell. That is literally, yeah. the, the, if you manage to control that and make a concept out of it, it's wow. Okay, I will let you go. Uh, you got to go to your stage. By the way, what you're going to do? What's the speaker? What's the stage? <laughs> do uh, some I don't do I haven't looked that up yet. I had a talk this morning. I've been focused on, on delivering my presentation. Now I get to go and context switch and figure out what's happening next. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you, Dylan, very much. Uh, we're going to catch you up on thank the you. other stage.